woke up this morning, I scrolled through Facebook and Twitter. I logged on to Amazon to check whether the present that I'd ordered for my son was going to make it in time. I looked at my daughter's Instagram feed to see pictures of our dog in Hobart. I asked Google Home what the weather was going to be like this morning and how long it was going to take me to get here. Deciding I was running late, I decided to book an Uber. Within 15 minutes, I had actually created a digital footprint with some of the world's biggest technology giants. Every interaction creating data that feeds the algorithms that make Facebook, Twitter, Google, some of the richest companies in the world. Algorithms that try to sell me things that I don't need, driving unsustainable consumption and contributing to growing inequality. The top 26 people in the world, the richest 26 people in the world, led by Jeff Bezos from Amazon, now own 50% of the value of assets of the poorest people on the planet. This is how we experience the digital economy. But it doesn't have to be like this. So how do we actually take the incredible power, the transformative power of digital technology to help create a sustainable future for people and the planet? Now, I want to be really clear. I'm not a Luddite. I don't want to shut Facebook down. I'm actually a techno-optimist. I'm inspired every single day by the amazing capacity of technology to help us solve some of the wickedest problems on the planet. But it's not going to happen automatically. Technology is not socially neutral. We get to decide. People have to decide how it's shaped and how it's used. And it's about time that we demanded a very different trajectory before it's too late. We are experiencing a digital revolution in every aspect of our lives, and it's driven by a tsunami of data. The data that people that we create in social media and the internet gets a lot of attention. And there's an increasing disquiet about how some of this data is actually being used. But honestly, it just pales into insignificance compared with the data that's been created by the Internet of Things. Devices that are connected to the Internet, continuously generating data. There's currently about 17.5 billion devices connected to the Internet, more than two and a half times the number of people on the planet. And by 2025, it's going to be triple that amount. To give you a sense of the absolute exponential growth in data, more than 90% of the data in the world was created in just the last two years. So suddenly, we can know things we've never been able to know before. Because every factory, every machine, every car, every tractor, every farm, every appliance, every person is capable of being connected to the internet and generating data. Now, the data in of itself is actually meaningless. It's just zeros and ones. It's when we convert it to information and then knowledge that drives real-world solutions that we are actually creating value from it. People often describe data as the new oil. But unlike oil, it can never be used up. You can use it again and again and again, and it doesn't lose its value. You can combine it with other data and run algorithms and models that create new and more data, and it's still not consumed. It's this nature of data that makes it so incredibly special and valuable. Now, in the world of data monopolies, of the social media and internet giants, it's these companies that reap the reward. So what's the alternative? Data markets, where the people and the companies and the organisations that create the data have control. 
They have transparency about how it's used, and they share in the upside. Now, when we created our business, we had a really clear and compelling purpose. We wanted to harness the power of digital technology to help feed the world without wrecking the planet. We felt so strongly about it, we actually put it in the Constitution. So, by 2050, we have to produce 60% more food to feed the world. The challenge is actually staggering. The basics of food production and agriculture are land and water. In the last 40 years, we have lost 30% of our arable land, a trend that's continuing. By 2025, we're going to have 40% less water than we actually need. And agriculture consumes 70% of it. And at the same time, we're trying to deal with increasingly erratic weather conditions driven by climate change. Now, in our business, we focus on taking the guesswork out of growing. And the biggest guesswork of them all is driven by weather. It's the one thing that growers can't control. And so we measure the 14 variables that drive all agricultural models in real time, farm, field, row, hotspot level, things like light, wind, rain, humidity. We then use artificial intelligence to create a microclimate prediction. But we don't just vomit data at people. We then turn it into applications that help growers make fast, confident decisions about when to plant, when to irrigate, when to feed, when to protect, when to harvest their crops. And growers already use this technology to improve their yields, to reduce their input costs, and to mitigate climate risk. So they're already making benefit for growers, and it's good for the planet. So in the yield, we're actually now focusing on the problem of waste. 30% of the world's food is actually lost in waste. And the critical thing that drives this is actually the uncertainty of weather. So let me give you a really concrete example. We're working with a company that grows leafy greens. In summer, it takes four weeks from planting to harvest. In winter, it takes 12. They know it's different row to row, let alone farm to farm across different states. So they overproduce every year because they don't have certainty about the harvest prediction. If they don't overproduce, then they either lose precious shelf space or they have to buy it on the spot market for twice the price. So our researchers taking historical plant and harvest days together with microclimate data have been able to use artificial intelligence to predict with a 97% accuracy the date at which the crop is going to be ready. Now, this is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially to this one business. If you start rolling that out across a supply chain, you're really talking about very large-scale change. We're now taking this same technology and applying it into other crops, such as viticulture, berries with other crops on the way. So the data is all there, and we know how to create value from it. But the critical issue is that we need to combine and share data if we're to make the best of models. Once we've created them, we can then put them into applications that can be trained on individuals' data and then be used for predictions. Open innovation and data markets drives new businesses to create new solutions, new opportunities, new business models, and ways to share data. Now, there are many different ways of creating incentives to share data. You can do it through revenue shares. You can do it through micropayments for data. You can do it through providing discounts on services. And at The Yield, we've experimented with all of these. Our planet is on a precipice. Every day, experts in civil society all around us are calling for urgent, unprecedented level of change. 
we can use the incredible power of digital technology in response. If we're going to halt climate change, loss of biodiversity and growing inequality. What we need is to harness this incredible capability of digital technology across the globe. Not narrow innovation controlled by an elite in Silicon Valley, but distributed innovation, where people all around the planet, business, community, researchers, are actually engaged in solving problems in their own community. They understand what these are. They have the resourcefulness and the motivation to solve them. What we need to do as a community is provide the tools of the knowledge economy so that they can be part of the solution and create an economic future for themselves at the same time. So what we need to do is understand how we create this new digital future. So how do we go about it? We demand it. We have agency in so many ways, in the software services that we buy, the companies we buy from, in the governments we vote for, in the organisations that we join and support. Every day we take private action that combined can create urgent and wide-ranging change. Our responsibility as citizens is to understand, to demand, and to act. Now, we have the technology to turn data into knowledge. But it's only when we turn knowledge into wisdom that we will really, truly thrive. Wisdom is a human endeavour. It's not something that you can teach a machine. And we need to use wisdom to create the sustainable future for people and the planet.